now we're going to move into step four. I'm going to flip back to page 59 so we can read that. And step four says, Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Okay, last paragraph on page 63. Last paragraph on page 63. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning. Notice there is no mention in here of taking a gentleness break. We're going to move right in. We're going to take some action. You notice it doesn't say that we're going to mosey out on a course of action. <laughs> it says launch. You ever seen a rocket launch? There's nothing subtle about it. It just takes off abruptly. So I'm going to launch on a course of action. Not a course of action, but a course of vigorous action. First step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision, here they're referring to step three. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. In other words, the experience that you're having right now of feeling connected to a God of your understanding, to your higher power, you will lose that if you do not immediately move into step four. But you see, I've had this experience of not immediately moving into step four, and it, says it could have little permanent effect. So I lose that feeling, that sense of connection that I'm experiencing in step three. I'm going to lose it. Here the authors are telling us what the primary purpose of step four is. It's to uncover the things in me that have been blocking me from this God of my understanding. You see, if I'm blocked from God, I'm blocked from you. It's like somebody just pulled a set of blinds in front of me and I can't see. I can't see this God. And if I can't see this God, I can't see you. And if I can't hear this God, I can't hear you. That's the fundamental purpose of step four. It's to uncover those things. It says so we had to get down to causes and conditions. A cause is defined as that which produces a result. Condition is defined as state of mind. So I need to get down to the states of mind that block me from God. See, when I'm blocked, then I have no access to power to stay sober and to be happy, joyous, and free. So ask yourself, do you want to be happy, joyous, and free? So maybe we need to get down to these causes and conditions. Next paragraph. Therefore, we start upon a personal inventory. This is step four. Business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. That's all it is. I don't like it. Even after all this time in these rooms, I still don't like doing inventory. I do it. The reason I do it, based on experience, of what happens as a result of, of concluding it. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damage or unsaleable goods, to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. We did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. Being convinced itself manifested in various ways was what had defeated us. We considered its common manifestations. The reason I don't inventory my assets are, number one, they don't block me from God. They don't cause me failure and they don't cause me defeat. My assets don't cause me problems. My liabilities do, my shortcomings, my defects. The biggest argument I've heard from people through the years, yeah, but we should inventory our assets. Why? Have they blocked you from God? Have they caused you failure? Have they caused you defeat? See, these are the things that block me. Next paragraph, resentment's the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From its stem, all forms of spiritual disease. For we have been not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In other words, I don't straighten out mentally, physically first and then get spiritual. I need to straighten out spiritually first and then the mental and physical is straightened out automatically. Okay, page 66, paragraph 2. 
Page 66, paragraph 2. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. You know what a resentment is? It's like taking poison and expecting someone else to die. They're home sleeping soundly. We turn back to the list, for it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We're going to look at what we write in our inventory from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state of wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, have power to actually kill. Now, I thought that meant kill me physically. Well, it didn't kill me. I can have that resentment. I don't need to do that writing. It didn't kill me. Yes, it did kill me. It can kill my spirit. It can kill my hope. It can kill my peace, my serenity, my joy, my motivation, my inspiration. Do you see what I'm saying? It can kill us in a lot of different ways. Eventually, for the alcoholic, it does kill them physically. I can be attending meetings in these rooms and still be dying in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because it has been my experience that I'm only going to experience one of two things in these rooms. I'm either getting better or I'm getting worse. To my knowledge, nobody has ever been known to coast uphill. If I'm coasting, I'm only going in one direction. How many people in here want to get worse? Not one hand went up. Okay. Page 67, paragraph 2. Page 67, paragraph 2. Referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. I'm going to look for my part in the resentment. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours. Not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. I remember in early sobriety thinking, I don't have any reason. I don't have any defects of character. You do. I would go to meetings. I heard lots of defects. I said, oh, my God, these people need help. I'm really thankful they're here. Let's, oh, my goodness. Listen, that guy over there. Boy, does he need to be here. I remember talking to my sponsor about it. I said, man, these people are really sick. And I, and I started going on. He said, yeah, really? Uh-huh. I, I know what. I want you to get one of those little pocket tablets and put it in your pocket. Next time you go to a meeting, and I want you to write down everything you dislike about those SOBs. Okay? And I said, you, you okay. I thought I was being a good little student, you know, a little good AA. And I went to meetings, and I pulled out my little tablet. And, yeah, arrogant, selfish, cocky. Slut, you know, <laughs> you know all these all these defects. And I remember meeting with him and saying, "Well, I got, I did my list, I did my homework. Now we know what's wrong with all these people, don't we?" He says, "Yeah." He says, "Now you have your, now you have your character defects." Wait a minute, I'm not a slut. Wait a minute, didn't you tell me you know about these affairs and oh yeah that yeah. And what I saw was I saw characteristics in people that disturbed me that I was unwilling to look at in myself. That's why they bothered me so much. Page 68, paragraph 1. Page 68, paragraph 1. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? So we're going to write about our fears and we're going to ask some questions. Okay, page 69. Ten lines from the top. Page 69, ten lines from the top, two words in from the left and two words in from the right. There's a statement in the middle of the line. Do you see it? It says, we all have sex problems. It doesn't say they all have sex problems. It doesn't say men have all, all men have sex problems. It doesn't say all women have sex problems. We all have sex problems. Last time I looked, I'm part of we. Next paragraph. We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. This is about our sexual conduct. 
Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go over the four-step outline that I've provided you. Go ahead and pull that out. If you do not have one of those, come on up and get a copy of that. You may notice that this outline looks a little different than the example that is on page 65. Be aware that all the items that are discussed in step four are listed on this paper. You will notice it lists causes, conditions, various states of mind, various manifestations of self, things that have the potential or possibility of causing you failure or defeat. It mentions fear, resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking, etc., etc. I got this outline from Clarence Snyder in Cleveland, Ohio. Clarence's sponsor was Dr. Bob. This is how Dr. Bob did the inventory. This is the way he taught Clarence Snyder how to do inventory, and Clarence Snyder in turn has passed it on. My understanding that in the early 40s when they were doing inventory, this is the way they did it at the time. It seemed to be very effective for them in producing a 75% success rate in that Cleveland and Akron area. And I figured, well, if it helped those guys so well, maybe it can help me. This is a very simple process. A couple of things I would like to emphasize about step four. You cannot do it wrong. You do not need to do it right. It probably will not be your last inventory. I hope for your sake. You turn over to page 71 before we go over this. Page 71, line 3 from the top of the page. Page 71, line 3 from the top. If you have already made a decision, that's step 3, and an inventory, that's step 4, of your grosser handicaps, you have made a good beginning. Doesn't say I'm finished. It's impossible for me to uncover everything that causes me failure and defeat in one inventory. You can spot people who do regular inventory in meetings. They're pretty easy to spot. They're spontaneous. They make fun of themselves. They laugh. They have a good time. They enjoy life much more fully. Why? Because the more inventory I do as the years progress, the more I become aware of my limitations. The more I embrace my limitations, the more peace of mind I have. Because now you know exactly who I am. I have nothing to hide from you. I get to be me around you. There's nothing to pretend anymore. And that's called peace of mind. And that's the byproduct of doing regular inventory. What we're going to do, we're going to briefly go over this list and come up with a real resentment. And I'm going to show you how to walk through the resentment part of the inventory. Basically, with all, the, with all the statements on this list, we are going to ask two questions. What I like to do when I take someone through the steps for the first time is I like to do the writing for them. The reason for that, so they're not distracted with writing. All they're doing is sharing. And I sit down and I do the writing so they can fully concentrate on what it is that they're, they're sharing with me. So in other words, you do it that way, you do the fourth and the fifth step at the same time. Because it tells us over here, in the fifth step, on page 72, it's in the second paragraph, about six lines down. We will be more reconciled to discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reasons why we should do so. The first, best reason first. If we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. I may not overcome drinking if I don't do inventory. Page 73. About seven lines down from the top. 
but they had not learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all their life story. That's why it's essential when we do this inventory in this workshop that we do it with someone who has had experience in doing the inventory in this way. That's why if you've been around the rooms for a while, we ask that you have an open mind in the event that you're paired off with someone who's only been sober a couple of months. You might have double-digit sobriety. It doesn't matter. I've seen it happen often. I've seen people with long-term sobriety being paired off with someone who is relatively new, who has gone through all 12 steps and had a spiritual awakening as a result of doing the steps in this way. And that person had a spiritual awakening again had a new experience because I can guarantee you if you approach these steps it doesn't matter if you're new or if you've done the steps multiple times if you will approach these steps with an open mind you're guaranteed two things you are going to have a new experience with the steps and you will discover some truth about yourself and that's what my sponsor regularly will ask me whenever I become resistant how free do you want to be Okay, so basically we're asking two questions. The first item is self-pity. You sit down with a person, you're going to ask them, hey, do you have any self-pity? Yeah, I got some of that. All right, give me some examples. That's the first question. Give me examples of your self-pity. You may or may not have all of these things on this list. That's why we ask that question. Do you have any self-pity? Yeah. Okay. Give me some examples and you're going to write those down. The second question we're going to ask per item is, who is affected by that? So the first question is, if you have it, give me examples. Second question, who is affected? We're going to move on to the next item. Self-justification. Do you have any of that? I can't think of anything. Well, did you ever justify your (laughs) self-pity? Did you ever justify drinking? Did you ever justify not going to meetings, not doing inventory? Self-condemnation. That's about beating ourselves up. Self-importance. Criticizing, negative thinking, vulgar and moral thinking. What is that? Well, I'll tell you what it is. You're sitting in a meeting and you're having sexual fantasies about someone in the meeting. That's vulgar and moral thinking. Do you have fantasies of violence or property destruction? Do you have that fantasy of waiting for that person around the corner with a baseball bat? Insincerity, procrastination, dishonesty, impatience, resentment, hate, envy, jealousy, laziness, lying, gossip, selfishness, fear. So we're basically going to ask two questions with the exception of resentment and fear. When we get to the fear, we're simply going to make a list of all the things that we fear. Resentment, we're going to ask numerous questions. So basically, I'm going to ask, what is the resentment? What's the reason I have it? What's my part in the resentment? Then I'm going to look for the underlying fear. What is it I'm expecting from that person? What is it I'm afraid I'm not going to receive? Let me give you an example from my own inventory. When I came into these rooms, I hated my mother. I hated that woman with a passion. She kicked me out of the house when I was 15 years old. Here I am, 15 years old, living in abandoned houses, sneaking in the back of restaurants, waiting for them to bring out excess food and getting food out of the dumpster so I could eat. And as a result of living on the streets and living in abandoned houses, I turned to a life of crime and I blamed her and I ended up in prison. It's her fault. Look what she did to me. I'm only 15 years old. She kicked me out of the house. It wasn't until I came into these rooms, had opportunity to do inventory, and I was asked those questions. My resentment was, my mother kicked me out of the house. How did I treat her? Not very nicely. I was out of control. Everybody in that house was terrified for their safety. My mother was at her wit's end. She had no other options available to her at that time. She didn't know what else to do. I was out of control. That was my part. What was it that I was afraid I was not going to receive from my mother as a result of her kicking me out of the house? It was very simple. She wasn't going to love me anymore. So you see, the underlying fear was fear of being unloved. 
I inventoried her numerous times before I got to the truth in that. The reason it is essential that we uncover the exact nature of our wrongs. Look at how step four is written differently than step five. In step five, we're not sharing a list of our wrongs. We're admitting to God ourselves and another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. That means the very nature means the origin, the cause of my wrong. In other words, specifically, how was I dishonest? Specifically, what did I lie about? Specifically, what was the underlying fear? You see, once I got to the truth about fear of being unloved, that resentment towards my mother melted away. When I was able to see my part, as it says here in the book, where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking and frightened? We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. I'm there to look at my part in that. So if it's not feeling resolved, it's generally because I haven't uncovered my part. I haven't uncovered the exact nature. And the only way I know how to get to the exact nature is through a series of questions. Not going to someone who is educated, but someone who has had personal experience in doing inventory and knowing what questions to ask. Now, when we do steps six and seven, if I don't know specifically what it is I want God to remove, he's not going to remove it. And the reason for that is because there's one spiritual law that God will not violate, and that's called free will. I need to know what it is I want God to remove. So if I don't know specifically that it's fear of being unloved or fear of being disliked or fear of being harmed to God in six and seven, it's not going to be removed. That's why I must know specifically what it is that I want him to remove. A couple of things to consider when doing your fourth step this week. Keep it simple. Know that you do not need to do it right and you cannot do it wrong. Ask for guidance from the God of your understanding and you will find that this is a simple and straightforward process. It does not matter who does the writing, whether it be you or your sponsor. What is most important is that you, you are willing to face the things that block you from the God of your understanding. Assuming that you did your fourth and fifth step, we're going to turn to page 75. That's page 75, paragraph 2. Page 75, paragraph 2. What we're going to be doing in the next few minutes is going over what we need to do after we complete our fifth step. In the event that your sponsor already walked you through this, I'm going to ask that you walk through it again with the rest of us in the workshop. For those of you that were not taken through the remaining steps in this way. Okay, paragraph 2. The authors say, we pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step, withholding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. These are the fifth step promises. As we mentioned in an earlier session, that there are not twelve promises in this book. There are many, many promises. These are the fifth step promises. Here's something to consider. The authors are saying, once I've taken this step, providing I withhold nothing, I'm going to be delighted. That doesn't mean I'm excited about what I'm sharing with you in my inventory, but am I delighted about the work I'm doing? Now, if I'm not delighted, I can shut the book and stop there. Because that's exactly what my first sponsor did with me. I did my first inventory. He said, are you delighted? And I said, no. And then he asked me a couple other questions. Do you feel that you can look the world in the eye? Well, no. Do I feel 
alone at perfect peace and ease? No. Are my fears falling from me? No. Did I begin to feel the nearness of my Creator? No. And he shut the book. <laughs> he shut the book and said, that's it. I said, what do you mean that's it? We need to go on and do the other steps. He said, no. He says, it says right here, once we've taken the step with holy nothing, we are delighted. He said, you left something out. No, I didn't. Oh, yeah, you did. About three days later, I give him a call and I say, you know, there was this one thing. There was this one little thing that I forgot to mention. And invariably, that has been my experience with people I've taken through the steps. They get to this point. They're not delighted. It's because there's something they're still holding on to. Because the authors are telling me, look how it's worded. Withholding nothing, we are delighted. These are the promises of doing the fifth step. Now, my own experience with the inventory was this was the first not first, but rather most impactful relationship, or rather most impactful experience I had with God. I began to have a much more impactful experience when I did my fourth step. Because for the first time in my life, I was able to sit down with another human being and tell them about all the stuff that I had done, all the harm I had caused other people, all the secrets that I had concealed. These were all the things that were blocking me from God. So you see, when I'm willing to disclose that to another person, I am going to be delighted. And I started to experience what it says in the next sentence, that I could be alone in perfect peace and ease. So consider that. If you're not delighted about what you're doing, there's probably something you're leaving out. The last sentence, it says, we feel we're on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. How many times have you been to meetings and heard the topic, let me hear your experience with being with the spirit of the universe? I, I don't see any hands going up. It's right there in the book. They're telling us this is what we're going to experience. This isn't about knowledge. This is, isn't about information. This is something we're going to experience. I'm going to begin experiencing Walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. What's that like for you? See, if I don't have that experience, I can't transmit it. And if I haven't experienced it, I certainly can't talk about it. So if you're having an experience of walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe, I encourage you to take that experience back to your meetings and tell people about it. Share your experience about walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Now, I would have resistance when I would hear people talking about these things in meetings. And the reason I had resistance to it is because I was not having that experience. So if you share an experience that I haven't had, my mind is going to have resistance to it. Oh, that's not possible. He's not really walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. He's just like the rest of us. He's a drunk just like me. Well, of course. But I'm here to tell you, when we take these steps in the way that they were done in the 40s, your sobriety is going to look really different because that's what happened to me. My sponsor took me through the steps very quickly. See, you cannot take anybody through these steps too quickly. But I'll tell you what, you can take them through too slowly. See, I'm the real alcoholic. I need to get through these steps as quickly as possible because I need to get to that power and I need to get to it now. Because I need power. Because I'm a real alcoholic. So, consequently, people I got sober with, some of them didn't get around to doing their four steps until they were six, seven, eight, nine, ten months. I wasn't superior to those people. All I'm saying is that my sobriety looked really different. I felt really different than they did. They struggled much longer than I did. Because when I went all the way through the steps, I had that spiritual awakening. The compulsion to drink was removed. Okay, next paragraph. Here the authors are giving us specific instructions on what to do when we finish our fifth step. Returning home... You notice after we do this, it doesn't say, you know, take a week or two to consider what you did. (laughs) It doesn't say go to a movie. You know, it doesn't say go take a bubble bath and relax. You've done a good job. (laughs) No, it says returning home. In other words, I've just finished my fifth step. 
Returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. Carefully reviewing. That's why we don't burn our fourth step. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in meetings. Yeah, I got done with my fourth step. My sponsor said, go ahead and burn it. Why? I need that inventory for future reference. Then they ask us to say a prayer. It says, we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know Him better. So if I'm going to thank God, that means I'm going to say a prayer. So I'm going to carefully review what I've already done. Then I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to thank God from the bottom of my heart that I know Him better. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. That means I'm going to flip back to page 59. Carefully reading. It doesn't say read. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask, if I'm going to ask, that's a prayer. We ask if we have admitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. So you see, if I'm going to be free, if I want that freedom, these are the instructions that are necessary for me to follow. In other words, I'm going to turn back to page 59, and I'm going to take the first five steps, and I'm going to take them... And turn them into questions. Have I admitted that I have no power over alcohol? Have I admitted that my life is unmanageable? In other words, I need a new manager. And then I'm going to review step two. Have I come to believe that a power greater than me can restore me to sanity? And then I'm going to go to step three. I'm going to ask that question. Have I made that decision? to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him. Step four, have I made a searching and fearless moral inventory? Step five, have I admitted to myself, to God and another person, the exact nature of my wrongs? And then they're going to ask us to consider further questions. I was taught that wherever there's this question mark in the book, it's like a stop sign. I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask that question. Is our work solid so far? So stop and ask yourself that. Is your work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have you skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? These are the things we will consider in this hour. Then we turn the page. Then the authors say, if, big word, if we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Do you know what indispensable means? It means I can't live without it. In other words, my willingness is indispensable. Here comes a question. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable? That which is objectionable is that which blocks me from God. When I'm blocked from God, I'm blocked from you. So let's ask that question of of ourselves. Are you now ready to let God? See, I have to be willing to let God remove them. So if there's something that I want you to take, let's say I have this this bottle of water up here. Let's say I want you to take this bottle of water and I bring it to you and I hand it to you and you grab a hold of it, but I don't let go. You could be stronger than me. You could be more powerful than me. You could be bigger than me. But if I'm not willing to let go of that bottle, you can't remove it. So you see, step six is about getting ready. The sixth step is preparing us to ask God to remove it. So that's all we're doing in step six is getting ready. Then another question. Can he now take them all? Every one. Ask that question. Can he take them all? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. There's a prayer. If you have some resistance, we ask God. The authors even give us a clue that step six is about getting ready. In the very next paragraph, they say, when ready. (laughs) So I have to make sure I'm ready. Okay, so am I ready? Okay, let's move on to step seven. When ready, we say something like this. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me. 
good and bad. Not some of me, not the worst parts, not the majority of me, but all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. We have then completed step seven. This is the reason we need to be specific about what we're asking God to remove. My own experience is that if I'm not specific and I don't know literally what it is I'm asking him to remove, he can't remove it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that he will remove it because I'm not God. I don't know when he's going to remove it. My job is just simply to identify specifically what I want him to remove. You notice that my name isn't anywhere in these two paragraphs? It's not in there, is it? So you see, I'm not working on my defects. You ever heard that? Yes, I'm working on my defects of character. Certainly. (laughs) If you hear me saying I'm working on my defects, really what I'm saying is, I'm going to embellish them. (laughs) The more I work on my defects, the worse they get. That doesn't mean I don't make a conscious effort to be honest, sincere, helpful, willing, thoughtful. Sure, go ahead and make an effort in those areas. You see, these steps are paradoxical. I don't remove the defects. I simply do the work and leave the results to the God of my understanding. So, you see, it's impossible for me to work on my defects if I'm applying these spiritual principles. Okay, let's see who's ready to uh, do six and seven. And what I'm going to ask is that we read the seven-step prayer out loud together. So, those of you that are willing to do so and and you feel that you are ready to let God remove all these things that have blocked you from him, Let's go ahead and say the seven-step prayer together. My Creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Congratulations. I want to welcome all of you to the Fellowship of the Spirit. And those of you that are on your way to being rocketed into the fourth dimension, congratulations for what you've done today, and thank you.